the 2000s. A decade filled with cooking rats, mean girls, and an insane amount of movies which we all just kind of consumed and then moved on with our lives. As if scenes like this were completely normal. <laughs> This was a time when blockbusters used CGI, whether or not the technology was ready. And even some of the tamest films managed to go completely off the rails just 10 seconds before the credits rolled. So that scene is exactly what I saw with no context like 10 years ago. I literally turned on the TV and saw that man transform into Morgan Freeman. And ever since I've wondered what the hell I just watched. So imagine my surprise this past New Year's Eve when I turned on a random 2000s comedy and it just so happened to be the one I've been searching for this past decade. The movie is called Bruce Almighty and it stars Jim Carrey as a news reporter who gets the powers of God played by Morgan Freeman. I'm God. Bingo! This actually became the highest grossing film of Jim Carrey's career at that point. So of course Universal decided to make a sequel without Jim Carrey. <laughs> It instead stars a minor villain from the first movie who maybe had four lines. It's by all means a baffling decision, but they did it because this villain just so happened to be played by Steve Carell, who since the first movie had become a big star on The Office, and they wanted to cash in on that success. So in Evan Almighty, they dressed him just like Michael Scott on the poster, right down to the mug, and then bet literally everything on The Office fans going to see this movie. By the end of production, this somehow became the single most expensive comedy film ever made, and it's completely insane. In the span of like 20 minutes, this guy transforms from a politician into Noah, as in the guy with the Ark. And it turns into a rather bizarre retelling of Noah's Ark, complete with a poorly conceived flood sequence in which he sails through the streets of Washington, D.C. <laughs> Shockingly, Evan Almighty was a box office bomb, and it represents a certain level of chaos that for some reason Hollywood produced a lot of in this era. And no movie's a better example of that than 2003's The Cat in the Hat. Hey, Rhode Island license plate, you never see those. <laughs> Some people might not call that cinema. It's currently sitting at a whopping 10% on Rotten Tomatoes. But if this movie has a million fans, I'm one of them. If it has 10 fans, then by the end of this, you better be one of the other nine. And if the cat has no fans, well then I'm the hat. Because there's a lot to love here. First off, everyone plays their parts extremely well. Mike Myers gives it his all as the cat. Beautiful initial here. Here. Not here! <laughs> Turn it over. This is nothing. There's also a beloved babysitter in this version. Oh. Hi, Mrs. Kwan. Hi. I'm running late. Thanks for babysitting on such short notice. Mm, yeah. Naturally, she ends up becoming a theme park ride vehicle in a scene that only exists so that the cat can do product placement. It's like a ride in an amusement park! You mean my cat? Universal Studios. <laughs> the production design is also some of the most effective I've seen in any movie. Today it would have just been green screen or forgettable CGI, but in 2003, Universal spent $100 million creating a world where you believe a talking cat might actually show up in a hat. Who is this? That's my mom. And perform in drag. Paris Hilton also shows up on the dance floor. Because at this point, why not? And even the minor characters, like this germaphobic insurance agent, somehow make comically bad dialogue extremely compelling. If your house is as messy as last time, you're fired! Now this is certainly not a faithful adaptation of the original book. At one point I think the cat pulls a knife. You're stupid. Now wait just a minute. And you're ugly, just like your mum. Did you just call my mother ugly? Shut up! I mean it! I will end you! 
that in one of the more unfiltered moments, the cat ends up cutting his tail in half. Cat, your tail. Son of a bitch! Dr. Seuss's widow thought it was so bad that she shut down production on the sequel. But I think where this movie went wrong with the general public is that the appeal of the cat in the hat is all for kids, yet the script uses humor almost exclusively aimed at adults. Mm -hmm. You're a control freak and you're a rule breaker. That'll be $700. Who's your insurance carrier? Yet despite all these obvious problems, to me, the cat in the hat strikes the perfect balance of undeniably entertaining and a little bit disturbing. And this is the lumpiest couch I ever sat on. Who is this dreadfully uncomfortable woman? Now I couldn't make this video without mentioning possibly the biggest movie franchise of the decade, Harry Potter. <laughs> Most people assume that since I have a Hogwarts banner in my room that I'm a huge Potter head. And like, yeah, I enjoy the movies. But the only reason I have it is because when I visited the Harry Potter world at Universal Studios, it was a very cold day in Florida and I wanted to buy something to stay warm. But it was significantly cheaper to buy this Hogwarts banner than the official Gryffindor scarf. Which by the way, I photoshopped in the thumbnail of this video. <laughs> Anyways, Harry Potter was so popular in the 2000s that it spawned an insane subgenre of movies trying to piggyback off of its success. My favorite of the bunch is called Thunderpants. Making Thunderpants was a lot different from making Harry Potter. The film was made in 2002 between production of the Harry Potter movies and stars Rupert Grint. Kind of. The main character was this unknown child actor, so the studio decided to cast Rupert Grint as his best friend, because that way they could dress him like Ronald Weasley on the poster and hopefully sell tons of tickets to Harry Potter fans. I don't know that their plan entirely worked. It has one of the craziest plots ever, and I can't wait to share it with you. But first, I need to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Factor. This year, I want to spend more time doing things that I love, and Factor makes that goal so much easier. They deliver fresh, never frozen meals right to your doorstep that are ready in just two minutes. So you can enjoy a nutritious meal without the hassle of going to the grocery store or wasting hours of your life on prep and cleanup, which for me means more time to play royalty-free songs on the piano. <laughs> Factor's meals are prepared by gourmet chefs and approved by dietitians, so each meal has all the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long. I also really like how flexible Factor is. They have choices like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and protein plus on the menu each week. And you can easily adjust your order size or even skip a week whenever you need to. Plus Factor has a great assortment of snacks, smoothies, juices, and more satisfying add-ons perfect for watching an insane 2000s movie. Head to factor75.com and use code MATTHEWABLE60 to get 60% off your first Factor box. Again, that's code MATTHEWABLE60 for 60% off your first Factor box box at factor75.com. Link is in the description below and thank you so much to Factor for sponsoring today's video. So try and put yourself in the shoes of the families who went to see this in theaters in 2002. They were probably hoping for something similar to Hogwarts, but instead got this. <laughs> So it starts off with the most ridiculous birth ever put on screen, and the kid launches out of his mother like 10 feet for no reason. And the first thing he does after being born is farts. For the entire movie. His parents tried putting a bag on his butt, but then it gets popped by a pair of scissors and their entire house explodes. So the dad leaves and never comes back. His sister has the worst wig I've ever seen, and everyone at his school hates him. Except Ronald Weasley, who for unknown reasons is played by a different actor in certain scenes of the movie. Daddy didn't care about my problem. Alan had no sense of smell. Then at school, he ruins an assembly. <laughs> Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, the foulest little creature to walk the earth. Now get out! So he takes the most natural course of action and decides to become an astronaut. Dear Space Center, I want to be a spaceman. But I have a problem. I cannot control my ass. And to combat that problem, Ronald Weasley invents Thunderpants. And then somehow he harnesses his fart power to make a flying car. 
then Ronald Weasley gets kidnapped. We eventually get him back, but not before Fart Boy goes on a world tour with a famous singer who needs him to fart a high note so he can lip sync to it. But then he farts again and literally breaks the theater. <laughs> and Fartboy ends up on death row. <laughs> then there's a trial. Guilty. 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 But luckily, the US government breaks him out of prison because they got his letter and he's gonna be a spaceman. <laughs> Evidently, Thunderpants is completely bonkers on every level, but things only get weirder from there with this late 2000s Harry Potter ripoff, The Mystical Adventures of Billy Owens. It stars wrestler Rowdy Roddy Piper as a knockoff Dumbledore, and his line deliveries are about the only magical thing in this movie. I trust that you're finding everything you need. It's a magic wand. How much? Well, normally that would be $15, but we have a 30% discount today, and I took my 15 there, and my 30% birthday discount, and... This movie has everything, from questionably animated dragons to insane wizard battles where you can see papers hitting a green screen. Your soul was lost in the river! Now, hope shall be. And while the big climax of Harry Potter is him facing Lord Voldemort, Billy Owens must overcome his fear of the number 11. Today, Billy just didn't feel like himself. Billy was born on November 11th. So maybe turning 11 on the 11th day of the 11th month was just too many 11s for anyone to handle. Now he doesn't quite overcome that fear before the movie ends, but only because the movie ends before the story ends. The last scene is just a vague cliffhanger for the follow-up to this movie, Billy Owens and the Secret of the Runes. I tried watching the sequel, but the dialogue was so bad that I actually had to turn it off. This will be a fierce battle, children. Mold on his own as a formidable opponent. So I hope that you found as much joy in this decade of movies as I have, but if you'd like this series to be continued, then don't forget to subscribe and let me know in the comments what other insane 2000s movies I should talk about. But until next time, 